Hello, and here we go, learning part two, um, where we look at operant conditioning. In a nutshell, all of the operant conditioning is this, learning to associate really uh, behavior with this consequence. Um, so here we, have, we learned to associate a response and its consequence, and therefore repeat acts that are followed by rewards and avoid acts that are followed by punishments. So that's it. You associate your behavior with the consequence. If you like the consequence, you're more likely to do it again. And if you don't like the consequence, you're less likely to do it again. That's it. And it really is that simple, but we do have to break it down. So starting with operant behavior, your behavior acts upon the environment to produce things that are rewarding or punishing. Um, so if you think about anything you might do, um, you, let's say, crack a joke in class. And how do people respond? If they respond by laughing, encouraging it, um, joking about it later on, bringing it up again, these are all rewarding things that make you more likely to crack jokes in class again. If it's like people respond by like nothing, like dead silence, or they get angry, or you get in trouble, um, then you've got, you know, punishment in your environment as a result of cracking jokes in class. Now, the pioneer of operant conditioning is really um, thought to be Edward Thorndike. So in this goal to make like psychology a more observable science, right, uh, all empirical, remember at the beginning, this focus was on, um, you know, how your behavior acts upon the environment, not at all what you're thinking or feeling inside. Um, Thorndike's not going to like come at it completely cleanly, and you will see uh, where like People like Skinner, they're using Thorndike's ideas. Um, they're going to use what he came up with, but they're going to change the language to make it a bit more scientific. And when it comes to um, Thorndike, really, uh, here's the big takeaway, the law of effect. Oddly enough, this is not the only thing titled the law of effect that we will have to look at um, in AP Psychology, but Thorndike's law of effect says simply this, that rewarded behavior is more likely to recur. So if you like the consequence, you're more likely to do it again. Bear in mind, though, that Thorndike did recognize that we don't all see the same things as rewarding or punishing. Um, so somebody who makes a comment in class and gets a lot of attention for it, one person might see that as uh, very rewarding, where another person might see that as completely embarrassing and would be less likely to do that again. He will study this um, phenomenon by putting a cat inside a puzzle box where the cat has to use essentially trial and error to gradually figure out a way to get out of the box. Once the cat figures out a way out of the puzzle box, they get rewarded with food. So it starts out trial and error and then it becomes more purposeful as you move along. But I also want you to see that Thorndike had a lot of ideas um, about learning. And although the AP will not ask you about them, I still think it's important to kind of take a look and see what he added. Um, because a lot of what comes after him is going to be built off of these things. They're, they're going to change some of the words around, make things a little bit more measurable, or in some cases a lot more measurable. Um, but here's what he started with. So the most basic form of learning is trial and error learning. Um, and I wonder if you think about any of these things, how much time do you have for trial and error learning in school? Um, imagine that it would ultimately be a pretty effective way to learn, but it would also be a time-consuming way to learn, right? So the, the opportunities to do that are probably limited. Um, he's also saying that learning is incremental, not insightful. That makes sense because um, saying insightful means that we don't have a like a step-by-step -step way to get there, right? The, the process you used isn't clear, and that's not actually true. Um, learning is not mediated by ideas. That's like all of behaviorism, saying that like your thoughts about it doesn't really matter that much. It's really your behavior and what you do. He said all mammals learn in the same manner and that we have a law of readiness. So interference with goal-directed behavior causes frustration and causing someone to do something they do not want to do is also frustrating. Probably speaks to your experience in some ways, right? When somebody is ready, and here's where the language really gets a little nutty here um, in terms of uh, measurability. When somebody is ready to perform some act, to do so is satisfying. What does that mean? 
um, when someone is ready to perform some act, not to do so is annoying. I think we define satisfying and annoying in different ways, so that becomes problematic. When someone is not ready to perform some act and is forced to do so, it is annoying. I think it all rings true though, right? And there's the law of exercise. We learn by doing, we forget by not doing, although to a small extent only, um, which is interesting because this does hold true, right? If you think from a neurological pers perspective, you're getting these neural pathways. We'll talk about long-term potentiation later. Um, the more you practice a skill, the better you get at it. Um, doing small pieces um, regularly would be better than like say studying for something or trying to learn something in one big chunk. Um, so connections between a stimulus and a response are strengthened if they are used. So there's that law of use. And then connections between a stimulus and response are weakened if they are not used. So the law of disuse. And honestly, I think it makes more, more sense to you guys to think about it in terms of like um, playing an instrument or a sport. Like you're not ready for a game if you don't practice all week, but you take all the time you would have spent and like practice the day of. Um, you won't be ready for the game. So you need that uh, practice time broken up throughout the week because that's what's going to make you better at it. Uh, same thing with an instrument. Obviously, you could send, spend six hours the day before your lesson cramming for it, um, and you will get much better results with less time spread out over every single day. Okay, so we have here the law of effect. Remember, that rewarded behavior is more likely to recur. That's the big one. That's the one you need. Um, multiple responses. A learner would keep trying multiple responses to solve a problem before it is actually solved. That's the ideal. The set or attitude. So what the learner already possesses, like prior learning and experience, their present state of mind of the learner. Um, all of this will matter when the learner is trying to begin uh, a new task. And lastly here, prepotency of elements. It's really this idea that... Um, like when you're learning something, you're going to focus on those things that you view as being most important or most essential to solving the problem. Um, and you will miss all kinds of other stuff. So this one has to do with the perception of the environment. Um, if you're focusing on, like, you know, if someone's teaching a class and you're focusing on what the, the teacher is wearing, then you're not focusing so much on what they're saying. Or if you're focused on solving a problem, what else is happening in the room that you aren't paying attention to? Um, that would be the prepotency of elements and that's completely determined by your perception and we'll get into that later. Um, Thorndike also says that we learn responses from analogy. Um, and this is actually one of the things I was taught early on when I was growing up is that um, you needed to be able to come up with an analogy. So if you understood a concept, then you should be able to come up with your own example for it, your own application. Analogies aren't perfect, right? Otherwise, they'd be the exact same thing, right? So there's going to be something imperfect about it, but being able to do so explains exactly what you know and what you don't know about something. If you can't come up with an analogy or you can't write your own example, then you kind of should question whether or not you understand it. You'll have to look for that. This associative shifting uh, it sounds complicated, but it, it's not that much. So let stimulus S be paired with response R, right? So now if stimulus Q is presented simultaneously with stimulus S over a period of time, again and again, stimulus Q is likely to get paired with response R. That's classical conditioning, right? Um, belongingness. If there is a natural relationship between the need state of an organism and the effect caused by a response, learning is more effective than if the relationship is unnatural. So if you take any basic thing that you're learning here for belongingness, um, like the things that belong together, that you can group together, are more easily remembered together. And uh, here is a picture of Thorndike. You can decide whether or not you think he's a snack, that's up to you. Um, but with this puzzle box and the cat trying to figure out a way out of the puzzle box, um, I want you to also notice something that um, Watson had also uncovered is that um, the time to escape, right? The time in seconds that it, ta it takes a cat to escape the puzzle box. Uh, notice that um, as the trials, as you increase the number of trials, the time it takes is less. Notice that relationship though is also not linear. Um, the trend is to get better or to be able to do it in less time. 
Um, but that is not a linear trend, and that's the same thing Watson had uncovered when he was testing um, animals in mazes. So a little bit about Skinner, um, because Skinner is going to um, build really a lot off of what Thorndike did. Um, he's going to have some problems with it, and some of those problems are going to be pretty obvious. Skinner's not going to be okay with him saying things like a satisfying state of affairs or an annoying state of affairs. Uh, he's going to have a problem with that. He wants everything to be measurable. But, um, but Skinner has kind of an interesting past, too, and I, I find it so helpful to remember what people did when you think about what their past was like. Because Skinner's going to end up this radical behaviorist. Um, but he, he grew up with, um, you know, I guess he, ha he had a younger brother. He was, um, I guess, two and a half years older than his younger brother, um, although his, his brother um, died of a sudden aneurysm when Skinner was in his freshman year of college. But his mom was kind of like a dominant figure. He was brought up, um, he was brought up Presbyterian. He was religious. Uh, Skinner's father was a lawyer. Um, he wanted Skinner to be a lawyer, but, uh, but he took, B.F. Skinner took no interest in becoming a lawyer. Um, and his father like never actually punished him. And, and so I think because Skinner will focus so much on the place of punishment, um, in psychology, it's interesting to know that he was never actually punished or physically punished by his dad, but there was always the threat of being punished by his dad. His dad would take him to jails and tell him that these are like the punishments that are awaiting him if he turned out to have a criminal mind. Um, and Skinner actually became like kind of afraid of police as a result. And he would always buy their tickets or, or like make sure to attend their annual dances, trying to stay on the good side of the law there. His mother actually only physically punished him once. Um, she washed his mouth out with soap for using a bad word, which I kind of find sort of funny because it's... <laughs> clean out somebody's dirty mouth. It's just it's taking a metaphor, I think, too far. But Skinner, basically, he liked to, you know, he liked to build things, take stuff apart, see how they worked. Um... I think he played the sax in school. He ended up moving to Scranton, PA uh, to attend Hamilton College. He almost got kicked out, actually, because he used to play pranks all the time. Um, one time he made a false announcement that Charlie Chaplin was going to be doing a lecture there, and he jammed up the campus and the local railroad station. It was all just a prank. Um, but he did graduate with a BA in English. He never took a psych class in undergrad at all. Um, Post-college, he had wanted to be a writer, and so he wrote some short stories and um, Robert Frost, the poet Robert Frost, had actually favorably reviewed a few of Skinner's short stories. Um, so he kind of like, he kind of felt like he'd make it there. And uh, so he lived in his parents' attic for a while and tried to write. And then he moved uh, to, you know, to New York City to try to write there. And it was all failed. He became depressed. Eventually, he was going to see a psychiatrist, but his father told him it would be a waste of time and money. So he, ultimately, he gave up this whole idea of writing with the thought that he actually had nothing to say. That was his conclusion. Instead, he ends up enrolling in um, a PhD program at Harvard, um, and he took courses in psychology. And that's where he seems to have um, documented an end to his depression. One sort of funny thing, though, about Skinner is that he had this, um, he's known for this Skinner box, right? Um, the soundproof container where an animal could press a bar or a lever, or a lever um, to release food or water. And the device would record the responses so they could kind of tell like how much they would have to press a lever in order to get a response or to get a reward. Um, and they'd set it at different uh, ratios or different intervals and to see how the, um, the animal would respond. Um, but Skinner was constantly publishing stuff and he had decided when he was having, like, he, he had two daughters and when he was <laughs> looking to, like, when they were having their second daughter, um, he had decided that it would be great to make this environment for his, the, the child that he already had to put her in a, a crib that, um, responded to all the needs much like, you know, a mother could, but without the competition with the two babies in the house and, he set up this whole thing that was supposed to be this, this great thing for, for a baby where the needs were being met, where the baby was happy and comfortable and would thrive. And he called it this air crib. And um, it got written up and reviewed somewhere as a 
as a baby box and he was accused in some cases of like abusing his his daughter which was just not the case she discovered it actually she discovered it in like she was learning about her dad in a psych class in school and saw that like he was being accused of abusing her which was just not the case at all and she was furious and she took it back to her dad and was like what like like look what they're saying about you this is awful I was not abused this is not how this went and his attitude was kind of like what do we care you know that's what they thought we know it's not true um I'm you know I'm a scientist essentially not not a publicist and I always kind of found his reaction to that so cool like that he was like so unconcerned because they knew the truth of it and so why would anyone else care um because I kind of thought he took this whole, like, here's the science, here's what we're studying, and that's it. That's, this is what matters. Who cares what everybody else thinks? Um, except to find out that when he passed, he had basically documented everything um, in case anybody wanted to write about his life. It was all, like, documented and organized for anybody that might want to write a biography about him um, when, when he passed. So I thought it was kind of funny because part of that seemed to me sort of a sham after that because he had everything planned out. But no, he never did abuse his child. He was looking to do something that was good for her. It just got some bad press, got associated with what he was doing with the animals and reinforcement schedules. An important thing I want to bring up here, though, is Skinner had a lot of publications. Um, and one of them was called The Behavior of Organisms. And what you'll note is that he believed that he could set up essentially this like utopian society where punishment would no longer be necessary if we were just aware of and could control the reinforcers in people's environment. So putting aside the fact that that would be highly manipulative, um, okay, just, just putting that aside for a second, um, and like sort of impractical, right? Uh, somebody would have to be determining what was good and worthy and what wasn't and what should increase and what not. He, but he, he actually did believe that there would be no need ultimately for punishment. Um, despite describing it, he thought we could end up in a world without it if we did this right. And he's going to miss some big limitations. Uh, he's going to fail to see the, uh, the limits of his theories. But, um, but like a true scientist, he's going to record what he sees and he's going to have graduate assistants, um, actually specifically Marion and Keller Breland, who are going to determine the limits of the studies that Skinner was describing. Um, they used, uh, as I'll explain at another point, they used uh, Skinner's work to train animals really to be in like performances, like circus type stuff. And um, they found that if they pushed the animal too far, it reverted back to instinctual behavior. And people didn't want to like talk about humans as having instincts too um that was sort of the the more freudian take and behaviorism was very far removed from that and brought that question back to the surface again um but skinner would have thought that he could establish this utopian society and here you go according to skinner if i'm just to simplify a lot of what he did here he says that there are five main obstacles to learning um, and see how it rings with you guys. So one, people have a fear of failure. Um, it's one of the things we try to get you past, but like just, you know, doing the whole hang your head in shame or who cares what your score is or, you know, in those was for the threes, whatever. Um, just to get over that fear of failure, just try something and mess up and be all right with it. He said, that's an obstacle to learning. Um, if the task is not broken down into small enough steps, you don't know what you're doing. Um, you're not going to get very far. If there's a lack of directions, um, I'd like to say I don't ever make this mistake as teaching as a teacher, but like no, for sure. Sometimes you you've given an assignment out and you're like you see how much people are missing it. And you're like oh, okay, I got to break that down further. Um, but you 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 see what's happening and, and you correct course. What can you do, right? Uh, a lack of clarity in the directions is a problem, and positive reinforcement is lacking. And these are Skinner's suggestions. Um, he says that any age-appropriate skill can be taught using these basic five principles um, to remedy the problems from the previous slide. So one, give the learner immediate feedback. And I want you to think about how hard that actually is. Um, how many times you take a test or you do an activity and then you, you kind of wait for feedback. In some cases, it's not even possible to get it back. And the fast five is where we can really kind of give you as close to immediate feedback as possible, right? 
got to break down the task into small steps. Makes sense. Repeat the directions as many times as possible. I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't agree with Skinner on this. Um, for some people with particular disabilities, yeah, 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 for sure. I'm going to have to keep repeating the directions because it's going to be necessary. Uh, generally speaking, though, that's a bad idea because if I keep repeating directions, what I'm actually telling you is that you don't have to listen to me because I will keep repeating myself. So I don't agree with him on that one. Um, work from the most simple to the most complex tasks. That makes sense. And give positive reinforcement. And breaking that down, uh, here is... <laughs> So many people are going to get like get this wrong, and I don't want you guys to be among them at all. So first of all, when you're looking at reinforcement, reinforcement is always going to be something that increases the likelihood of a behavior. That's it. If it's reinforcement, it doesn't matter. The behavior will increase. Primary reinforcers are anything that satisfies a biological need. So like, Food is obviously a biological need, right? Um, getting a hug is a biological need. Um, particularly when kids are like really small babies, they need those hugs. They need that for proper development. That's satisfying a biological need. Um, secondary reinforcers, I guess, I guess I should like also, if I'm going to say sex here too, as a biological need, that's not one of those things that like you'll die without like food, just sort of the species in general will. Um, all right, so secondary reinforcers are anything that we kind of associate with satisfying a biological need, but it in itself has to be learned. Um, so sure, getting money for something, give a, a, a child, a, you know, a one-year-old money, it doesn't mean much to them. They have no idea until they learned that money can buy them other things that they would like. Um, and praise, attention, material possessions, these would all be examples of secondary reinforcers. Okay, now positive reinforcement, this is when you are adding something to uh, you're adding something to a situation in order to make it so we're adding something to the situation or in order to increase the likelihood of a behavior recurring. Um, if you get asked a question like this, this is one of those multi-step things. You can't say adding something somebody wants. No, you have to say, adding something to increase the likelihood that a behavior will happen again or, or get that behavior to recur. That's it. Yeah. All those components need to be there or it won't score. Um, so positive, you're adding something. So I can give you a sticker for doing well on something. You can get paid for doing well on something. You, whatever, whatever it is, you get a treat or whatever. Negative reinforcement is so frequently confused with punishment, and it's not. It's not the same thing as punishment. Remember, reinforcement is something that you want. Reinforcement will always increase the likelihood of a behavior re recurring. If it's punishment, it will say punishment. Reinforcement is always something that you want. So negative reinforcement is you are taking an aversive consequence away. So taking it away, taking an aversive consequence away in order to increase the likelihood of a behavior recurring. Um, so in all cases, you're trying to increase the likelihood of a behavior recurring. So if I give you um, like homework, let's say, and let's say that you don't want to do homework. Which I don't know why that would be the case because you know that's going to strengthen learning, but whatever. Let's say you don't want the homework. So to you, homework feels like a punishment. Okay. Um, and you do really well on this test. So I say, all right, well, since you did really well on this test, you don't have to do this homework assignment. That would be negative reinforcement. I'm taking away something that you don't like in order to increase the likelihood that you'll be prepared for the next test, that you'll be ready again. When you go inside your car and you start your car, right? And it starts beeping because you didn't put your seatbelt on. Um, that noise is really annoying, right? So when you put your seatbelt in, it takes away the annoying noise. So it's negatively reinforcing you to put on your seatbelt. So I want you to consider this scenario. So let's say I have a small child, small three-year-old, let's say. And I take the three-year-old out to a restaurant and the three-year-old pitches a fit, starts screaming. Now, the likely thing in this particular case is I would leave with the screaming three-year-old. We would just not stay. Um, because, because 
I don't want to mess something up here and I want my kid to be able to go to restaurants without screaming and I need to teach them how to do that. Um, but what you'll see happen a lot is this sort of thing. So a parent goes into a restaurant, have their screaming three-year-old and they want the, um, the kid to stop screaming. You know, you have other people there that are kind of giving you that like side eye and like looking at you all judging and all annoyed or whatever. Um, and so the parent could, let's say, frantically go through their handbag, let's say, and they find a lollipop. And so they give the screaming three-year-old a lollipop. Um, and then the three-year-old stops crying. So what was that? Was that positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement? Well, here's the truth. The truth is it was both. So here's what's happening is that if I give a screaming three-year-old a lollipop to get them to stop crying, I am positively reinforcing crying. So I'm basically saying like, okay, like you scream and cry and I will give you a lollipop. I am making them more likely to cry when we go out in a restaurant because I just rewarded them for it. That's how they will see it. Now, the negative reinforcement comes in like this. The kid was screaming, which is miserable for me, right? So when I give the kid the lollipop, the kid stops screaming. So the child then reinforces me so I'm more likely to have lollipops on hand so I can give it to the child when they scream. So the parent is negatively reinforced in this circumstance and the child is positively reinforced. Bottom line is, the child will not learn how to behave appropriately in a restaurant and this scene is going to happen again. I take you back to <laughs> real life thing, you know, having uh, Jack and Charlie under the age of two um, in a stroller double stroller waiting in a line at Target and Jack, I believe it was, was screaming his face off because he wanted something and that's not how we go about this. I had already told him no. He was screaming. I had to get out of the store. I was waiting in line um, and that person came up to me and was like, don't you hear them? Don't you hear him screaming? And I was (laughs) was thinking like, it is so much worse for me right now than it is for you. And, um, like, yes, I know that this person wanted me to do something to get him to stop screaming, but really the only thing I could do was get out of the store as fast as I could because if I gave in to his screaming, then he wouldn't know how to behave when I took him out and I wouldn't be able to take him out um, because his behavior would be so bad. And I didn't want that to be a thing. So uh, part of teaching a kid how to respond appropriately is also not reinforcing them when they're doing something that you don't want them to do. And honestly, this can get cold. So like, you have to kind of also play it in a situation. There are some circumstances where you just have to do the best you can. You can't just pick up your child and walk out. And like, you know, you get your kids screaming at a wedding. You're not likely to be at one of these things again. I get it. Like, you're not likely to bring it with your child like that in that circumstance. I get it. Like, these things will happen. Um, And you don't want to be cold. And you want to respond to your kids' needs. And so that's really important to keep in mind. But in those moments where you don't really have to and you can solve the problem by just walking out, um, and not reinforcing it, then that's probably a good thing to do as well. You know, you're not hold- withholding affection. You're not withholding love from the child. Um, you want to teach them so that they are well-liked when they go out uh, to do things. And, you know, um, in those, though, those little moments here and there, um, you kind of you, you kind of respond to your child and what they need. Um, in the bigger thing, you want to look at, like, what patterns am I engaging in? What am I teaching them long-term? Um, so you kind of want to be mindful of both. You want to respond to your child and you also don't want to teach them bad habits. It's a balancing act. Uh, punishment is a different thing. So with punishment, you are looking to decrease. Punishment is always looking to decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring. So this is when you're applying an aversive consequence, something that the person does not like in order to make them less likely to engage in a behavior again. Now, positive punishment simply means that you are adding an aversive consequence to diminish the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. So you're making a behavior less likely to occur again. And negative punishment means you are taking something away. It's just the direction in order to decrease the likelihood of a behavior recurring. So that's it. So you're looking to stop something from happening. Now, an example of positive punishment could be like yelling. So let's say that every time you were late to class, I yelled at you. That would be me adding an aversive consequence to make you less likely to be late. Um, So that's it. I'm adding the yelling. If you were to yell at your dog every time your dog um, 
digs a hole in the yard. That's a positive punishment. Oh, don't do that, though. A negative punishment, you're taking something away that the person wants. So, um, okay, so your teenager comes home after their curfew and you take their car keys away as a result. That would be a negative punishment. You're taking away something that they like. Um, they want to go on the computer, right? But um, they're getting punished for something, so you take away their computer time. That's a negative punishment. And the whole goal there is to decrease the likelihood of a behavior recurring. I want to um, discuss, though, some of the potential problems with punishment. So let's say that, yeah, let's say that um, you come late to class and I punish you for that because I want to make you less likely to come late to class. So let's say um, as soon as the bell rings, I lock the door, I get everybody else started with an activity, then I go out, open the door, and go out into the hallway and, um, and yell at you guys. Okay, so I'm doing some punishment here. The question is then, will you come Will you be late to my class? Will you come late to class? Um, no, you're not likely to come late to my class. That's the whole point of the punishment, right? Is to decrease the likelihood of a behavior recurring. Um, but there's some issues with this. And so let's, let's go through that. So let's say that that's the scenario we have here. Um, so one, it can be addictive. So if I learn that you respond to my yelling, I am more likely to become the type of teacher who yells a lot. Um, and you could see where that would be a problem. Um, so it may damage the relationship between punisher and the punished. Yeah. So I uh, yell at you, you get to my class on time, but you will like me less for it. Um, you will feel less close to me. We will have a harder, more antagonistic relationship as a result of this. Um, and that will interfere with the learning process. And I'm not interested in that, right? It also inhibits the behavior. It doesn't extinguish it. So if you think about it, if I'm yelling at you for being late to class, does that mean that you will, are you going to be more likely to show up to my class on time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what about your other classes? Nope. As long as they're not yelling at you, you will know that I'm the punisher and I'm the one that you need to kind of hide that behavior around. So it's not going to generalize. So it, and that's something very important. Punishment inhibits a behavior. It doesn't extinguish it. Um, it shows you what not to do, but, but not what you should do. So um, people who, let's say, get hit, like if you get spanked, which is obviously, you know, was a thing way back when, uh, when people would get spanked, and then the messenger you're teaching them is like, oh, you get mad at somebody, it's okay to hit. Um, it doesn't teach them how you should be responding when somebody uh, gets mad, and thus can this whole sort of thing can increase aggression, and it's going to model bad aggressive behavior. And the thing about it is I'm also not suggesting, as Skinner was hoping, that there'd be no need for punishment at all. But, you know, sometimes there is a need for punishment, particularly around issues of safety, right? You've got to keep someone safe. Sometimes inhibiting a behavior is going to be enough, um, but hopefully you'll have enough in place to try to also teach the correct behavior. Uh, so you do want to use it, um, you know, reserve it for those things that are really important, I think. Oh, I can give you an example of how you kind of put all of this stuff together, this, this reinforcement and punishment sort of together in a class. I was uh, co-teaching a class with another teacher at the school, and um, it was a math class, and we set up this situation where it was like, okay, the kids really need to do their homework in order to learn. That makes sense, right? Um, in math, as in other subjects as well, but you have to do that practice. Um, and so, like, it was hard to tell when you're trying to check homework because it was all over the place or it wasn't labeled properly or you just couldn't tell what they were answering sometimes. And so I was making these worksheets that were, like, fully labeled so that they could, like, you know, instead of using the textbook, they could just use the sheet and everything was contained. It was easier for me to tell if it was right or wrong. And um, the situation was this. The kids would hand in their homework at the beginning of class. There was this amazing TA in the class. And she would go through, I'd give her a key, but she'd often make one herself anyway. And she would check the work and give me immediate feedback. And so I could talk to the person I was co-teaching with and we could be like, okay, yeah, like they're not understanding this concept. We need to go over this more or whatever. So I was getting that like immediate feedback, which was fantastic. But the way to motivate the students so that they would do the homework, we, we worked it out like this. Um, that if you did the homework and you showed your work, you put forth an honest effort on it, uh, you would get 100 on the homework assignment, 
regardless of how you actually did. So we're trying to encourage you to do the homework assignment. Now, if you didn't, so, so, there, so there, I should say, that's your positive reinforcement right there, 100% just for putting forth an honest effort. Perfect. Um, positive reinforcement. Um, but we did have punishment built in. So if you didn't do the homework assignment, you would get a zero on the assignment and you would have to show up to a mandatory ninth period with me where I would have you doing math problems the whole time. Um, so, so, so the zero plus your ninth period is gone. Um, okay, so there's your punishment. Now, I'm not interested in damaging relationships here. I really was trying to motivate homework. So I needed to give people a way out of the punishment, and that seemed to be key. So it's like, okay, we have positive reinforcement, and then we have that, the punishment built in, right? Now I want to be able to get rid of the punishment. So that class met like a fourth period, I think. And so um, they had lunch where they could do uh, get their homework done if they needed, right? So if they didn't do their homework and they finished their homework assignment before the start of ninth period, before ninth period, you can come and show me that your homework is done. Then you would get 50% back on the homework assignment and you wouldn't have to stay for ninth period. So there is the negative reinforcement, the removal of part of the consequences. So you get the most just by doing it in the first place. And then once you get this punishment, you have a way out of the majority, really the majority of the punishment, because you get half your credit back, plus you wouldn't have to stay for ninth period. Um, I never had kids have to do this. Like I think maybe two or three times ever did a kid have to actually stay for ninth period. It was so rare. Um, and as such, we were able to really help these guys with math because that's what we needed to be able to do and setting up this system enabled us to get it done. Now, with a small class and two teachers, um, that was more manageable than a bigger class with one teacher, but you put other things in place to try to make that happen with a lot of these principles in mind. I, I would use by myself, I would institute punishment far less, but certainly opportunities to try to um, correct course. The goal is still learning, right? So enough reinforcement should be built in uh, to help with the learning process. All right, so this whole picture that we are painting here is all going to fall under, um, in operant conditioning, under this idea of shaping. So shaping is the big umbrella for where this all fits. So when reinforcers are gradually guiding an animal's action towards the desired behavior, that's, that's uh, shaping. You're teaching a desired response, reinforcing a series of successfully improving steps leading to the final response, um, and really ignoring the things that are not what you are looking for. Um, and it's really helpful for teaching things that are behaviors that are not likely to occur naturally, right? So um, a kid is not likely to just suddenly like know how to make their bed. They need to be taught. And so, you know, uh, covering their bed, like first taking their blanket and pulling it over the top of their bed counts as making their bed. Um, and that makes sense. If you look at um, little kids uh, in kindergarten, let's say, and they're, you know, they have a spelling test and they get like the sticker on it and it's like a hundred percent great job. And you look at it and you're like, every single word is spelled wrong. Um, yeah. Cause when like they're, they're looking for different things. So at first, like if they're looking to spell the word cat, so have a picture of a cat and they have to write down what that is. They're being taught to first hear that initial consonant, right? That k -k -k, So they might write it as a K. And if they're hearing the, the final consonant sound, right, then there's a T. And so a kid will write KT and the teacher will score that as 100% correct. Well, yeah, they were listening to the initial and final consonant sounds. That's perfect. They will learn to sort out the K and the C later. They will learn to hear that, um, that vowel sound in between later. But you got to start with just reinforcing those initial tasks and ignoring everything else. So forget the fact that the rest of the word isn't correct. They were listening to the initial consonant and closing consonant. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. So you want, you're building up step by step, and the expectations change as you go. So one thing that might be acceptable in the beginning of kindergarten would not be acceptable at the end of kindergarten. And shaping, this would have been the method by which Skinner thought he could, you know, remove the need for punishment altogether. So when you're looking to shape behavior, the first thing you have to do is watch how the animal naturally behaves in the, envir in the environment, and then you're going to want to build upon existing behavior. Um, so if you wanted to, um, and don't do this, this would be awful, but get me to teach from, like, say, sitting behind my desk, first you'd have to watch where I typically stand in the room. 
you kind of have to get, get a sense of where I am, like the area with which I normally walk around, um, and start with what I'm already doing in order to get me to do something that I don't normally do. And the next thing you would do is probably the most important part of shaping would be successful approximations. You reward responses as they get closer to the desired behavior and ignore everything else. So you want me to teach from sitting behind my desk? Okay, so maybe you take like, maybe you take a, you know, a foot on the left side of the room and you say, all right, like nobody, well, first you'd have to know what my reinforcers are. So think of social reinforcers in a classroom. You might think like, okay, well, eye contact, nodding. You know I like head nodding. That's a big thing with me. <laughs> so nodding heads or raising your hands or answering questions or whatever it is. Um, you know, looking lively in many ways. But let's say that, you know, if I'm standing on that, like by the chalkboard on the left of the room, uh, if I'm within a foot of the chalkboard, nobody answers my questions, raises their hand or looks at me, right? So as I kind of walk away from that area, which I'm likely to do, then you just go back to being normal. And without ever having to be consciously aware of what is happening, I will eventually stop going in that section of the room. Now, obviously, I'm not recommending that you do this. One, it would be very manipulative. Um, two, you'd all have to be on board with it as well. Um, let's see. But I just want to show you as like sort of how this can be done. Uh, so after, after a while, when I stop going over to that foot, take off another foot in the room and be like, okay. Now it's two feet from the wall where I get ignored and then eventually three until eventually I'm behind my desk. Now you have to figure out how to get me to sit down. Um, that'll be another challenge in itself, but you're starting with what I am already doing and limiting my, uh, limiting that zone because I'm getting what I want when I'm over here and I'm not getting what I want when I'm over there and I will learn. It's like when you're training, um, you know, if you're training a puppy to go to the bathroom outside, first maybe you cover like say the kitchen floor with newspaper. And the puppy, as long as they go on the newspaper, they get a treat. And if they're off the newspaper, you don't punish the puppy. You just simply clean it up and they get no reward. And they will learn on the paper good, off the paper bad. Um, and then you start like removing some of the newspaper so they have a smaller section to go on. And so you have just, you know, like maybe a sheet of newspaper out and they'll go there. Move that piece of the newspaper closer and closer to the door eventually outside, and then eventually you get rid of the newspaper altogether and your animal is going outside. A funny thing, though, that people will do sometimes is um, they will give their, their dog a treat. And so we have to talk about this, the timing. They'll give their dog, let's say, a treat for going to the bathroom outside. But if you want to give a dog a treat for going to the bathroom outside, that's fine. But then you have to carry treats with you while you're outside with your dog because that reinforcement needs to come within 30 seconds of the desired behavior or the wrong associations will be made. So um, if, like, if your dog goes to the bathroom outside, then comes inside the house and you give the dog a treat, the dog will think it's getting a treat for coming inside the house, not for going to the bathroom outside. So your dog will pester you to go outside very frequently so that they can come back inside and get a treat. Um, so you're reinforcing the wrong thing in that particular circumstance. With humans, I get that it's not always possible. So you might be like, okay, well, if you get all of your homework done um, before dinner, then you can go on the computer for an hour, let's say. And so that might be very motivating, right? So you get all your homework done before dinner, but then it's dinner time. You can't spend an hour on the computer and that reward is supposed to come within 30 seconds after. Yes, it is, but you can also just tell them that they're getting it. So it's like, okay, you did all your homework, you will be allowed to use your computer for an hour. Um, we're going to have dinner first, but then you get the computer for an hour because you earned it. So you just say it and that's fine. Or, you know, a class has promised a pizza party if they do X, Y, and Z. Okay. I guess those were kind of before pandemic stuff, but all right, you're promised a pizza party, you earn it. And then we say, okay, you earned your pizza party. So tomorrow or Friday or whatever the day is like, here you go. You'll have your pizza party, but you have to tell them. Uh, say it right away so that the right associations are being made. Easier with humans than with other animals. And we talked about uh, discrimination or that discriminative sim stimulus in the other slides, but that's that cue that leads someone to know whether or not a behavior will pay off. So I gave you the example of our dog Sandy that used to say, you know, like we used to say good girl when she could eat something, but we'd say food curl to see if she was paying attention. So she couldn't eat a food curl, but she could actually my brother do that, but she could eat a good girl. Um you've learned to, like, if you're driving, uh, you learn red light means stop, green light means go, and you get the difference. Um, your 
likely to answer your phone only when it's ringing, right? So that's a discriminative stimulus. You know um, when there's like, like a small child will know to ask their grandparents for toys rather than their parents in a typical situation because um, grandparents are more likely to say yes or less concerned about that sort of thing. And I'm generalizing there, obviously, um, but it's just knowing, who, you know, who to ask for what, you know, um, that's a discriminative stimulus. And I mentioned this already, but it should, like, it has to keep coming up. Um, timing of reinforcement must come within 30 seconds of the completed task. Otherwise, the wrong associations are made. Okay, so the timing of reinforcement, this is going to matter. So delayed reinforcement, um, I'm going to put this, like, these two big categories, but mostly... I just want you to see the problems with it. There are four types that you're going to look at, and this isn't one of them, though. So delayed reinforcement is just having to, like, put off something. So um, getting a trophy at the end of a season or a paycheck at the end of your two weeks or whatever it is, a report card at the end of a marking period. Um, this it depends upon somebody's ability to delay gratification. So the bigger the person, obviously, technically, the easier time they should have with being able to do that. Small kids would have a harder time with it. But there are lots of things that, a um, lot of small, very immediate reinforcers that are sometimes a lot more appealing than the bigger ones with the bigger consequences, but that are delayed. So, you know, a, a new episode comes out of a show that you're really like, but you have to study for a test and you're worried about your final grade for this particular class and you have this test. Um, and you know that you will do better on the test if you study and if you get a good night's sleep, but you have this new ep came out or a new season came out worse, and there's all these eps you want to watch. Um, sometimes the episodes went out, um, despite the fact that you've got goals with your grades um, and what you want to do with them, and then you're trying to repair that stuff later. So you want to watch out that you're not grabbing too many, too much of a low-hanging fruit, if you will that you're not going for too many small reinforcers that give you that immediate feel good, um, you know, where you're missing out on the bigger stuff that align more with your goals. And continuous re reinforcement is just not practical. So uh, to getting a desired response every time you engage in a behavior would be really unlikely to happen. Um, could you imagine like every time you make a sales pitch, you make a sale? Not very likely to happen. Um, the other issue with this is that if the if you're getting reinforced every time, like so, so I, I I make a pitch and I make so say I'm selling bikes and I I try to pitch this bike to you and you buy it and every time I pitch a bike somebody buys it, great. Then the first time somebody doesn't, um, that's a big hit, right? So that extinction um, is going to happen very quickly. So you're going to learn to sell these things very quickly. You're going to be reinforced. By the money you might be making selling these bikes and whatever um, money you make as a result of that, um, but then when it doesn't happen, you will quickly abandon the behavior. I mean, think about it. You put like money in a vending machine to get like a candy bar, let's say, and it's like, oh, you keep winning every time. You put it in, you get the reinforcement of a candy bar. <laughs> um, but the first time that um, that machine starts jamming and not actually spitting out the candy that you want. Um, you be start to become hesitant in using that machine very rapidly um, until eventually you won't trust using that machine at all. So most of the schedules that we are going to look at are going to be partial or intermittent reinforcement schedules. Um, you're not going to normally use these continuous or partial intermittent as categories because there's something that you're going to be able to say that's more specific in most examples. So keep that in mind. But um, a partial or intermittent reinforcement schedule is more typical. So sometimes your responses are rewarded and other times they are not. Um, so the initial learning is going to be slower than it is with continuous reinforcement, but it's going to be harder to extinguish that learning. Now you go back to, let's say, like that child that throws temper tantrums and if the parents are reinforcing the temper tantrum every time it happens well when they stop reinforcing it the kid will get worse at the, at the outset and then their behavior will improve right um, because ignored behavior uh, gets worse first before it gets better um, 
But uh, if somebody is partially or intermittently reinforcing it, so a kid throws a temper tantrum and sometimes it's reinforced and other times it's not, the kid doesn't know when they're going to get the reinforcement or not. That is really hard to extinguish. You would have been better off reinforcing it every time than just some of the time. You think about people sitting there at slot machines that sit there all day because they're constantly afraid that this is the one time I'll put money in and it'll pay off. So if I leave this machine, somebody else is going to sit down and get really this, this reward that I've been waiting for all day. It's hard to extinguish that one. And if you think about it in terms of relationships, like a guy, I'm using it from my own perspective, a guy that calls once in a while and inconsistently, unfortunately, um, harder to kind of break the ties with that one, although you'll probably want to. Okay, so here are the main types, and I want you to notice that there are uh, two choices of word in the first position and two choices of words in the second position. So in the first position, it's going to be either fixed or variable, and in the second position, it is going to be either ratio or interval. So starting with fixed, it means that it's not changing, and ratio is the number of responses. Um, and actually, maybe it's just better, like, you know, fi fix is unchanging, variable is changing. Ratio is the number of responses, interval is an amount of time. You don't want to mix any of that up. So I see fixed ratio, I know that I'm dealing with a fixed or unchanging number of responses. Um, so reinforced behavior after a set number of responses. So an animal might get reinforced after, say, 30 tries at something, um, they will get reinforcement. And what will happen is, okay, so you, uh, 30 hits on the lever and then they get food. They will eat their food, take a short break and then continue. If you work for a bike shop, let's say, and you get paid for every 10 or paid after every 10 bikes that you make, then you make your 10 bikes. You'll notice at the beginning responding is slow, but like as you get closer to 10, you kind of pick up your pace you finish your 10, collect your pay, pause before continuing again. Now look at the word in the first position, variable. Variable means it's going to change. It's not a set number. And ratio means I'm still dealing with number of responses. So provide reinforcement after an unpredictable number of responses. This is a high rate of responding because more tries means the more possibility for reward or reinforcement. This one is extremely hard to extinguish. A writer, for example, is only going to sell a, a stories occasionally, so they're going to have to write more stories because it increases the probability that they'll be able to sell more stories. Um, selling door-to-door, -door, the more doors you go to, the more likely it is that you will make some sales. Gambling, the slot machines fit into this category. Going fishing, another thing that fits into this category. Now on to this one in the first position, fixed, so it's not changing. Uh, the second word is interval, so we're dealing with time now. So you reinforce the first response after a fixed period of time. It does not have a steady rate of response. So for this one, as an example, um, if you're expecting mail and your mailman comes in and around, or your mail person comes in and around the same time each day, um, then you find that you are not checking your mailbox until you're getting closer to the time when it should come. College acceptances work that way, like if it's a mailbox or if it's an email or whatever. If they say, all right, the, they'll have the answers out to everybody by 5 p.m., then, you know, at 4 something, everybody starts checking, and at closer to 5, the frequency of checking increases. Um, and then, but you notice it's a time. So, like, if I bake cookies, um, however much time the cookies take to bake, as soon as I get closer to the cookies being ready, I start checking more frequently. So with here, you, you want to notice that it's going to have a choppy start pattern, right? People, it's going to be slow at the beginning, um, but productivity will increase around the time um, of the desired reinforcement. If you think about it in class, you're, if you're waiting for the bell to ring, which of course you're not, but like you'll see that kids are more likely to be checking the clock towards the end of class than at the beginning of class. And lastly, variable in the first position, so it's going to change, and interval in the second position, meaning dealing with time, a changing amount of time. So reinforce the first response 
after varying time intervals. This produces slow and steady responding. Nobody knows when the waiting will be over. This one is extremely hard to extinguish. So you put your phone on silent, um, and then you keep checking to see if anyone texts, or you keep checking your email to see if somebody has written something. You keep checking social media to see if anybody liked your post or your TikTok or whatever it happens to be. But as that constant checking, no amount of checking it is going to make it more or less likely that there's something there, right? But you don't know when it's going to happen. There's, it's totally out of your control. So the checking behavior tends to be kind of frequent in this one.